the world's tallest man, the world's biggest hands, and now the world's largest pair of jeans. American blue jeans maker Levi's displayed the world's largest pair of jeans at the Chamsel Olympic Stadium in Seoul, Korea. Aptly named Big Jean, the jeans are modelled on the company's legendary style 505, but are 20 times larger than what you would normally find in stores. Big Jean has been listed in the Guinness Book of Records since 2001. 29 metres in height, Big Jean is almost as tall as a 10-storey building and higher than the stadium itself. Weighing in at 226 kilograms, it's 25 metres wide. 35 engineers sewed for nine days to complete the jeans, a total of 300 hours, and the cost, around 52,000 US dollars. It's quite an effort to make big jean ready for display. It takes four people to close the four meter long pant zipper, and the size of big jean's back pockets are almost the size of a king-sized bed, able to fit four to five adults. Big Jean's front button, which has the traditional Levi's icon stamped on it, is as large as an automobile tire. And there's plenty of room to move around inside Big Jean. A crane was required to hoist Big Jean into position before it was ready for the public to admire. Once up, 35 adults showed just how big it really was. Big Jean forms a part of Levi's 150th anniversary celebrations and Seoul was its third appearance. It was first displayed in Canada before being moved to China. It's said that too many chefs spoil the pot. However, it was a case of too many critics that came together in London to cook an Italian feast in support of the international charity Action Against Hunger. Too Many Critics is a group of many of the city's top restaurant critics. Among their guests were a number of international top chefs, including a handful of Michelin-starred cooks. The dinner was held at Locanda Locatelli, one of London's best Italian restaurants. This is the third year Action Against Hunger has partnered with a top London restaurant to raise money for its relief programs. The charity helps more than 5 million people in countries around the world, with projects from helping the malnourished to assisting families towards self-sufficiency. 100 diners attended this year's feast and each paid over 160 US dollars for their meal. All the food and wine enjoyed during the evening was donated by various sponsors. The critics in the kitchen write for British newspapers like The Evening Standard, The Guardian, The Independent and The Times. Another member of the Too Many Critics team is Jancis Robinson, OBE, a professional sommelier or master of wine. Highlights of the menu included a salad of skate fish, chili and anchovies, pumpkin risotto with nutmeg, venison with wild mushrooms and a cream sauce, and the traditional Italian dessert tiramisu. The dinner guests were able to follow the action in the kitchen on TV monitors positioned around the restaurant. The chefs in the dining room could then watch the restaurant critics sweat it out in the hustle of the kitchen. They were led by restaurant owner and chef Giorgio Locatelli, who ensured the part-time chefs kept pace with the demands of serving a five-course meal to 100 diners. Renowned television chef Antonio Carluccio was part of the action, which included a mystery wine competition where diners bought tickets to play. They were served an unlabeled wine, and if they were able to guess its origin, they won a case of it. The night's event raised at least 25,000 US dollars. And over in the United States, Christie's Auction House in New York prepared for its autumn jewellery sale, where big money was expected to change hands. Gems of the highest quality were on the block, including a giant 27-carat diamond pendant necklace, expected to sell for half a million US dollars. But the most anticipated item holds historical as well as monetary value. A ruby and diamond necklace that Eva Peron wore to official functions in various portraits and even for an Argentinian postage stamp is estimated to bring in 200,000 US dollars, but could easily be expected to bring even more, according to officials from Christie's. 
Eva Peron rose from obscurity when she married her country's president, Juan Peron. The people of Argentina idolized her while her husband ruled. But when she died at the age of just 33 from cancer, she became nearly immortal to the country. Six years ago, a pin bearing the flag of Argentina and belonging to Mrs. Peron was expected to earn 200,000 US dollars, but brought in nearly one million. That auction ended with the underbidder running out of the room in tears. The sale of the diamond and ruby necklace should be far less heated, but Christie said there was a romantic air about the piece. Classic jewellery will vie against contemporary at this sale, with a number selling for the first time. Art Nouveau and Art Deco jewellery were expected to pull in buyers. A multi-gem and enamel necklace, along with a crystal sapphire pendant, could each go for more than $150,000. As hot as the Peron necklace is a pair of earrings made by Jar. Each clip is a large orb covered with specially cut diamonds. And appraisers say the set should bring in $150,000. Jar is a hot commodity among the crowd that can afford to wear the brand. Buyers must actually fly to Paris to commission pieces by the creator, Joel Rosenthal. But a 31-carat heart-shaped diamond should come off as the heavy hitter for this auction. Slated to garner $400,000, the piece weighs enough to give its wearer whiplash. There are more than 400 items up for auction, and at these prices, diamonds had better be a girl's best friend. Israeli scientists have invented a capsule containing a miniature camera that travels through the body, producing full color images and enabling painless gastrointestinal examinations. The unique M2A capsule developed by Given Imaging Limited of Yokniam, Israel, contains a miniature video camera, flashing light, battery and computer chip, and passes naturally through the digestive tract without interfering with the patient's normal activities. Miniature electronics and complementary technology allows the capsule to transmit high-quality video images that enables doctors to observe a range of disorders of the small intestine. After fasting for eight hours, the patient buckles on a belt-bearing wireless recorder and then swallows the two and a half centimeter long capsule with a glass of water. The recorder receives signals as the capsule is propelled through the small intestine by peristalsis, the natural contracting motions of the digestive system. The capsule is designed to be unaffected by the highly acidic environment. Dr. Zvi Fireman, head of gastroenterology at Hiffel Geif Medical Center, is one of the specialists using the procedure. He believes that it has many benefits, especially as it's not invasive. Most important of all, though, is that the patient's daily routine is not disturbed to any great degree. Those undergoing the procedure may conduct daily activities including eating, working, playing and sleeping until the capsule is discharged from the body. Once retrieved, the capsule is taken to a special computer workstation where the images are processed. The end product is a short video clip of the small intestine together with additional relevant information from the digestive tract. Avi Shakehead is the owner of Inside Body, a company that purchases capsules from given imaging. He provides services like a professional report on CD-ROM once the procedure is complete. The process enables gastroenterologists to find the sources of unexplained bleeding, abnormal growths, as well as signs of irritable bowel syndrome and other conditions which may then be treated as necessary. The M2A capsule isn't expected to replace endoscopies or colonoscopies as they can be utilized for treatment during their operation as well as diagnosis. But developers believe that the new technology will save the health system considerable money. Given Imaging is in the process of setting up clinical trials to determine whether the technology can detect problems that are notoriously difficult to diagnose. However, it's not yet planned to be used on patients who are pregnant, have had major abdominal operations, a history of abdominal obstruction, pacemakers or diabetes. To date, over 52,000 patients worldwide have swallowed the M2A and have been used in clinical practice of capsule endoscopy.
fashion designer Valentino created a very light, evanescent spring-summer fashion collection for the Paris catwalks recently. He took his audience on a dreamy vacation full of old-fashioned Riviera elegance and teasing wispy dresses and floaty skirts that threatened to billow up and reveal all at the slightest breeze. Ribbons and bows trail delicately from hips and elbows as swirling chiffon gowns in candy pinks and turquoise had the audience literally gasping. The Italian godfather of fashion said he wanted every outfit to make a woman feel like she was wearing nothing. The collection was sexy and very light, designed to show off long bare legs with above the knee hemline or long dresses slashed to the hip. Glossy hair hung loose and lips were fire station red as shimmering barebacked cocktail dresses and Catherine Hepburn-esque trouser suits in satins and silks begged to be shown off on a slow cruise from Saint-Tropez to Tahiti. Valentino also included in his collection sailor suits turned sensual, navy blazers with silver buttons or square-necked blouses with frills of lace perched atop swirly white skirts and little navy shorts. They certainly evoked the salty smell of the ocean and images of pristine yachts. They stalk their prey through the extreme environments of ice, tropical jungle, desert and ocean, lying in wait for their moment. And they're just the photographers. With a click of a button, years of practice, research, artistic vision and patience can come together to create enduring images of our natural world. And the best images produced make it to the Wildlife Photographer of the Year exhibition and competition. Jointly organised by the Natural History Museum and BBC Wildlife magazine, it's the world's biggest and most prestigious wildlife photographic competition. This year was the biggest ever with over 20,000 entries from more than 60 countries around the world. Winners were announced in 12 categories in all. The overall winner, Wildlife Photographer of the Year, was Gerhard Schulz of Germany, whose photograph Gorilla and Boy, depicting two primates lost in thought, allowed the viewer to draw his or her own conclusions. The exhibition, which displays all 109 winning and highly commended images from the competition, will remain on show at the Natural History Museum for another six months. Meanwhile, the tough brown fruit of the horse chestnut tree was the focus of another event in Britain, the annual Conquers World Championship. About 5,000 spectators turned out at the village green of Ashton in the southern English county of Hampshire to watch this unusual sport. More than 300 competitors from as far afield as Australia, New Zealand and the United States entered this year's contest many sporting fancy dress costumes. The contest, now in its 39th year, was originally started by a group of local fishermen after a planned angling match on the nearby river was sunk by bad weather. Instead of wasting the afternoon drinking, a conquer match was arranged and thus the world championships were born. However, this year there were fears that a conquer shortage caused by a dry summer would scupper the contest to find king and queen conquer. These were allayed after fans donated thousands of conkers to the cause. The game involved swinging a conker threaded on the end of a string at an opponent's conker with the aim of smashing it. Traditionally, the conkers are hardened as much as possible. Methods used included soaking them in vinegar or salt or baking them for about half an hour. Some individual players used to swear by storing them in the dark for a year. Every conker enthusiast has his or her own muck and magic recipe. 
However, competitors don't need to worry about this as organisers provide some already prepared, also ensuring that everyone who takes part is in with a fair chance. The loser is the one whose conquer shatters first. John Hadman, event organiser, said 1,200 conkers were used in the championship as 350 competitors battled for top honours. But English conquer competitors cracked the foreign opposition and smashed their way to victory. Debbie Oates, a 24-year-old crime analyst from Walthamstow, East London, took out the women's side of competition. Both she and 39-year-old Brian Stewart, a forklift driver from Corby, Northamptonshire, beat Vikings, priests and soldiers to take top honours as King and Queen Conquer. A delighted Brian and Debbie collected their trophies afterward at a special presentation ceremony. It was the second year running that English winners swept the board, making amends for the 2001 contest when a French woman captured the women's title. Europe's largest auction of yearling bloodstock racehorses has just taken place at Britain's headquarters for racing, Newmarket. The Tattersall's annual October yearling sale has produced more winners than any other European auction and over a thousand horses were catalogued for the event. The bloodstock are all aged two and will no doubt provide the racing industry with the winners of the future. It's a chance for the equine industry to see new bloodstock from Europe and the USA with pedigree backgrounds that have the potential to become great themselves for their new owners. Jimmy George of Tattersall said that most buyers were looking for an athletic, good-looking horse with a decent temperament and that all-important pedigree. And while some of the bloodstock went for hundreds of thousands of US dollars at the auction, others were more reasonably priced. And with that, the opportunity to find a bargain that could turn out to be a champion racehorse. With so much at stake, many buyers put their faith in bloodstock agents like Dwayne Woods. He'd recently opened his own stud farm and was looking for up to 15 new horses. And for Jamie Railton, the largest British seller of horses at this sale, it was the culmination of two years' hard work. Tattersall's yearling sale generates around 75 million US dollars per year. It's time to travel and this week we're headed to the idyllic setting of the Whitsunday Islands, located off the tropical coast of Queensland in Australia. Bounded by Hayman Island in the north and Brampton Island in the south, the Whitsundays were discovered by Captain Cook during his landmark voyage of the east coast of Australia in 1770, appropriately on Whitsunday. And there's plenty to do once you arrive. Take a helicopter ride over the magnificent Great Barrier Reef. Enjoy a day out with friends and family sailing in the pristine waters. Go swimming, snorkeling or sunbaking and enjoy some fabulous local food. Or simply relax, laze in a hammock beside your bungalow and let the world and the friendly resort staff take care of business for you. The Whit Sundays have something for everyone, young and old alike, and there's plenty of accommodation to choose from to suit every budget, from the exclusive Hayman Island Resort, playground of millionaires, to cabins and camping on Hook Island, it's all there to enjoy. And the views from any angle are always spectacular. And after a perfect day on the reef, what better way to go home than to sail off into the sunset? See you soon in the Whitsunday Islands. Tracy Edwards leapt to fame over a decade ago when she led the first all-female crew in the Whitbread Round the World Yacht Race. Despite plenty of setbacks, the women conquered all but one yacht to finish second. A mighty effort indeed. Now she and her team have won sponsorship from the Gulf State of Qatar to set up two major races for ocean-going sailing boats. In December 2006, the Qatar Sports Global Challenge Race will start from Doha, the country's capital. 
But before that takes place, a non-stop global race for giant multi-hull crafts called the Oryx Cup will start from Britain in January 2005. It will carry a cash prize of 1 million US dollars. Britain's Prince Andrew played an important part in bringing together Tracy and her Qatari sponsors. And 95 million US dollars is the total figure for the project, one of the biggest sponsorship deals in the history of sailing. The four-year sponsorship program will put Qatar at the forefront of international sailing and their decision was based largely on Tracy Edwards' high profile in the sport. Under her new Qatar colours, Tracy will also be making an attempt on the round-the-world yachting record, the Jules Verne Trophy, as early as this coming winter. And finally, in Mexico, Colombian cyclist Javier Zapata set a Guinness World Record as he bike trailed up the tallest building in Latin America. The 30-year-old broke his previous record by going up the 1,318 steps of the Torre Mayor building in Mexico City. Hundreds of observers watched the one hour and 30 minute ride from a giant screen down below. It wasn't long before he arrived safely at the first floor, but with 59 to go, it was going to be a long haul indeed. Zapata is credited with introducing the sport of bike trail to his native country. Also known as cyclo trails or trails in, it's a sport in which individuals on specially designed bicycles compete to manoeuvre through a series of sections without their feet touching the ground. And there were plenty more sections like this to go. Zapata has already set other world records, most recently in Caracas, where he rode up 1,200 steps in one hour and three minutes. One final difficult flight of steps and the record was his. Zapata and his trainer, Harold Bedoya, celebrated the victory afterward, making it all look very easy. But Zapata revealed that this particular attempt was difficult. He was plagued with fatigue and the bike slipped at one stage, causing him to almost put his feet on the floor. And on that note, it's time to say farewell. See you next time.